just transition to what? Why? By when? With what supply chain? Just transition to what? Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society and the mainstream press has been full of commentary about the proposed legislation coming in in 2023 for a just transition. But what's it really all about? I mean, there is kind of a discussion document about how it should be people-centered and fair and and uh, people are considering all oh, the poor oil and gas people are going to lose their jobs but it's okay because we're going to make a just transition we'll make it fair for everyone but what are we really going to transition to so let me walk you through some information in this little powerpoint see what you think just transition to what Here's the total energy supply by source in Canada from 1990 to 2019. As you can see, we're powered by coal, by natural gas, by nuclear, by hydro, by biofuels and waste, and by oil. So what are we going to transition to? Wind and solar? Because that's this tiny, thin little line here. So it's obviously impossible to transition in the next 7 to 20 years to wind and solar when we're actually almost wholly reliant on fossil fuels for our energy. And ironically, to get wind power, you need oil. And you need coal and natural gas and mine materials. This is a very short little piece by Václav Smil, who's an international expert on energy, and uh, he puts it very straightforward for everyone to understand. You need oil. So, just transition? Why? Why are we planning to transition to something else? This is the global uh, view of energy consumption. And uh, so renewables are a bit bigger here, but really, proportionately, not much. So those who expect to eliminate fossil fuels expect this little orange line to replace all of these large uh, bands of uh, coal, natural gas, and oil. Uh, does that seem realistic to you? And oil is alive. OPEC projects growth in demand, significant growth. And Canada is a world leader in oil gas production. So what would replace this national revenue stream? Because energy exports in 2020 represented 18% of total Canadian goods exports. So that's larger than motor vehicles and motor vehicle parts, which are the second largest category. Just transition to what? The green jobs broken record has reappeared on the scene with this report by Smart Prosperity Institute and a new offshoot they call Place Center. And it's called As the Weather Changes, How Clean Growth and Climate Action in Canadian Communities Will Be Shaped by Global Economic Trends. Well, as we saw, the biggest trend in uh, global economics is for more oil and gas. <laughs> and coal. All three of them are going gangbusters right now and there's an energy gap actually that's why there's such problems in Europe because there's just not enough natural gas anywhere in the world to supply them for their needs because they've cut off Russian gas and in fact ironically um, there are reports that they're buying gas from Russia except they're buying it via other countries in the world that are rebranding it as if it's coming from them and paying a premium. So there's a huge energy gap in the world, but these people believe that there will be all kinds of green jobs in your neighborhood. Let's have a look at what else they say. They claim that clean growth and climate action will create jobs, attract investment, and benefit Canada's economy regardless of what occurs globally in 2030. They think that there will be 300,000 new jobs created within the decade. 
Well, let's look at Smart Prosperity's track record. In 2017, they issued a report, um, and we issued a rebuttal. In their report, they claimed that there would be 60,000 jobs every year to 2020. <laughs> And uh, Smart Prosperity's report states that McKinsey foresees clean innovation in Canada's energy sector, leading the development of 60,000 new jobs every year from now, that was 2017, to 2020. And uh, we said that this was an astonishing forecast that does not appear to be tied to a specific industry or product, and particularly even then considering the rocky state of economies and geopolitics worldwide. Now, we have another report called Green Jobs, Rhetoric or Reality that shows that some 2.2 jobs are lost for every green job created. And it's interesting to note this comment from a book called The Firm, which is about McKinsey, which is where Smart Prosperity drew their, um, their numbers from. And it says McKinsey's optimism should be weighed against this comment. It's an impossible number to quantify this firm's economic impact, given that McKinsey doesn't actually make final decisions for its clients. But it may not be too far off the mark to suggest that McKinsey has been the impetus for more layoffs than any other entity in corporate history. So yes, it was a fail, and the parliamentary budget officer had a look and came up with the conclusion that the supercluster funding behind schedule was unlikely to create even 10,000 jobs. Just transition. By when? By 2030? Sure. Canadian emissions have been flat for 30 years despite a 37 percent increase in population. So what that means is that Canadian industry has been very good at reducing emissions. But on top of that, we've brought in hundreds of thousands of immigrants, and uh, each one of them brings their own carbon footprint, and when they get here, they normally expand their carbon footprint. So we haven't been able to have any reductions per se, because every person who comes here increases our carbon footprint. Usually people are coming from places that are warmer like India, the Philippines, China. So when they get here, of course, they need winter coats, they need natural gas heating for their house, they need a house. So um, it's far more energy intensive place to live. So uh, immigration here will always drive up our carbon footprint and we will never meet climate targets, nice as many immigrants are. And our own scientific advisor, Dr. Madhav Kandekar, is from India. So. We're not saying anything about immigrants. We're talking about their carbon footprint and the ridiculous notion that we can meet climate targets through carbon taxes when we're bringing in hundreds of thousands of people every year. And um, it's important to note that they claim that the just transition is people-centered. This is their big discussion paper. But in fact, the uh, government is also running a thing called the Century Initiative, which was also sparked by people from McKinsey, as a matter of fact, and they're advocating for policies to increase Canada's population to 100 million by 2100. So um, one of our followers on Twitter did the math for us, Darshan Maharaja. Per capita emissions of CO2 in Canada was 16.58 tons in 2016. Current population, 37 million. Adding another 63 million people would increase our CO2 emissions by 1.05 billion tons yearly. And he says, I'm not even going to go near the supply of housing and services. So there's no just transition with mass immigration. And of course, when you have people immigrating, they need integration services. They need housing, health care, education. It all takes energy and it all takes money. And ultimately, emissions growth is not occurring in the West. So this is a report that Robert Lyman did called When Giants Arise, talking about the emerging nations like China, India, Brazil, and some of the African nations. So many people, especially in Europe and North America, may not be aware 
that their combined populations are only 15% of the world's total, and that the population of Africa exceeds that combined total, and that the population of Asia is four times that large. So that's where the emissions growth is going to happen as these groups develop their economies. Now, Europe's economy is dying because of the uh, energy crisis, and North America, we're, we're only 5%. Europe is 10%. So this is where the emissions growth will take place. So what we do doesn't really matter. Just transition by when and with what supply chain. So this is a plain language report that's based on a very complex thousand page report by a fellow named Simon Michaud, which he did for the Finnish Geological Survey. And what uh, Simon Michaud did is that he looked at um, the necessary critical minerals and he simply extrapolated the global metal production of 2019 to what would be required to meet net zero commitments just to see how long it would take to mine it, how much it would cost, and how complicated would it be. So it would take 189.1 years to mine the copper, uh, 402, uh, 4.2 years for the nickel, 9,920.7 years for the lithium. Well, you get the picture. It's the pursuit of the impossible. So no one has thought about the supply chain issues. Now, the other thing is that it keeps saying, well, net zero 2030, net zero 2050, um, to create a new mine, even if it were possible to mine the necessary materials, to create a new mine and get it up and running takes about 16 years, if there's no environmental opposition to it, which there normally is, in, certainly in Canada. So. None of these things can be done overnight, and no one seems to have even thought about this very practical and important element of these climate targets. But you might say, well, what about the climate crisis? Well, a climate crisis appears to be a project of the World Economic Forum. It seems that they took this nice young girl who was literally terrified because of seeing a film about dying polar bears and they exploited her fear and she became their walking advertis advertisement for um, the alleged climate crisis and, and why do I say that? Because I'm going to ask you to start looking at this alleged climate crisis as a very sophisticated global marketing campaign. Just notice how creating a crisis about something like presently, natural gas stoves are allegedly the health and climate crisis. This popped up overnight. And what's happened? Well, now they're really pushing induction stoves. You see how this is a demarketing campaign to push a new product that people don't really want. Um, but if they're afraid of gas stoves, if they, oh my gosh, it's causing asthma, it's causing climate change, I better get an induction stove. Well, that's awfully good business for that firm, isn't it? And good business for Amazon. I just saw some tweets go by where someone was pushing this one plate induction stove where you could try it out at home without making a big investment. Um, so uh, look at it as a sophisticated marketing scheme, first and foremost and less so as a climate change catastrophe or a scientific issue. Once you do that, you start to see things a bit clearer. And to support my statement, the Parliamentary Budget Officer debunks climate alarmism. In November, Canada's Parliamentary Budget Officer released a report on the effect of greenhouse gas emissions on Canadian GDP growth over the next 80 years. Now, just to remind you, um, we often hear from climate activists that the costs of inaction are huge and catastrophic and we'll never recover from it and it'll destroy our GDP and our country and our economy. So we have to act right now. We have to do everything right now as fast as possible. Um, but let's see what the parliamentary budget officer had to say. 
looks like Ross McKittrick, who's an economist, he writes that he wrote a short summary of the report, um, that the, the overall conclusions agree with mainstream economic thinking on the link between global warming and economic growth, or the lack of it. So the parliamentary budget officer didn't use some esoteric thing. He actually used conclusions that agree with mainstream economic thinking, and he also used similar formulas to what is used um, by the mainstream climate community. So the parliamentary budget officer used two scenarios. One was emissions reduction policies stall out at today's levels, nobody complies with their Paris Agreement, and the second one was that countries do comply with all their Paris commitments in full and on time. And um, the PBO was advised by Environment and Climate Change Canada to assume that Canada will warm by 2.5 degrees Celsius by 2100. Now, Dr. McKittrick considers that an overestimate, and many people in the climate community would consider 2.5 degrees C warming as absolutely catastrophic. But let's see what they come up with. So what if every country stalls out? The economic impact of climate change is small. Under Scenario 1, Canada's GDP in 2100 would be 6.6% smaller than otherwise due to negative impacts of global warming. So assuming a modest 2% growth in Canada's economy, Dr. McKittrick calculates the GDP would grow by 388% over the next 80 years. But according to the PBO, if we do nothing, it will only grow by 381%, which is a small difference compared to other drivers of the economy. And in fact, the IPCC's fifth assessment report also concluded that the economic impact of climate change is small relative to other drivers. So the parliamentary budget officer shows that the cost of inaction is tiny, but the cost of compliance is huge. In scenario two, with everyone meeting their Paris targets above the 6.6% difference, um, the above 6.6% difference becomes 5.8%, <laughs> which is a minuscule difference of 0.8 percentage points. Incurring the enormous costs of complying with the Paris Agreement will mean that Canada's economy will grow not by the assumed 2% per year, but by 1.986% per year. However, the compliance costs will take an order of magnitude more off our growth rate. Dr. McKittrick notes that one of the justifications cited for climate action is the cost of inaction, uh, suggesting that it's something that is just far too large. But here, according to the PBO, it's tiny. So the cost of inaction is tiny. If we do nothing, the impact on our GDP is very, very small. And the parliamentary budget officer went on to say, while the impact on Canadian GDP is from global GHG emissions, Canada's own emissions are not large enough to materially impact climate change. Yeah, that's right. But look what they want to spend in the people-centered just transition. Here's just a few numbers I pulled from that report. $15 billion for investments, $15 billion for public transit, $17.6 billion for green recovery. These are real huge numbers that could be applied to health care, veterans' needs, housing, just transition. Well, Canada, as the PBO pointed out, we're not the large emitters. China emits in one month about what Canada emits in one and a half years. So we could wipe Canada completely off the map and there would be no difference to climate change and global emissions. So no transition is necessary. No just transition necessary. There's no climate emergency. This is from Clintel, showing that there's really no huge uptick in temperature. And climate change is cyclical. This shows 2,000 years of cyclical climate change by its color stripe. So it's not you, and it's not CO2.
you can see that it's been much warmer in the past. I hope you'll read our report called Climate Injustice for All. Maybe you'll support our work. Maybe you'll donate, send an e-transfer to contact at friendsofscience.org. Or join us, become a member at friendsofscience.org. I want to thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope it's given you some insight on the curious just transition proposals because it seems like there's nothing that we can just transition to in terms of other energy forms. It seems like we'll always need oil, gas, and coal and in very significant quantities. It seems like our competitor nations like the OPEC countries are going full speed ahead in developing oil and gas. And it seems like the climate crisis is really just a sophisticated marketing scheme to push things that people don't really want. But in the context of a crisis and with uh, the CO2 is satanic gas labeled all over it, then people um, become afraid or VENCAP organizations raise huge amounts of money for things that really don't make life better. They just make it way more expensive. And it also seems like every time there's one new green job, we lose 2.2 real jobs. So that doesn't seem like a good or just transition to me. But I'll let you have a look at our report and you can decide when you look at the full facts. Let's see what you think. Uh, let us know in the comments. If you have questions, you can put them there. We'll try and answer them. And I thank you very much for listening to the presentation. Have a great day. Have a happy new year. And there's just no need for just transition in Canada. Thanks very much. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.